Lisboa, primavera de 2014. Encontramos Siri Hastvedt, escritora americana de ascendência norueguesa. Uma mulher fascinada pela arte, pela neurociência e pelas muitas vozes e significados que a literatura revela. As últimas décadas testemunharam progressos assinaláveis para as minorias e as mulheres. Mas o progresso não é uma linha reta. Os impérios descrevem arcos, erguem-se, vivem momentos de plenitude e, por fim, declinam. Estes podem ser os melhores e os piores dos tempos. Somos observadores ativos do mundo. O desenvolvimento vem de fora, do social, do político, mas também de dentro, do corpo e da mente. Vivemos, pensamos, observamos. I mentioned Martin Luther King. I grew up as a child during the civil rights movement. My parents were uh, very sympathetic to the movement. Uh, we watched the marches on television. So that was part of my childhood. And King's speech resonated very deeply, uh, of course, with black Americans, but also with white Americans. Uh, And I think as a child, I spent uh, a lot of time imagining what it would be like to be, you know, a little black girl in the South. You have a, an essay on, on the verbal climate uh, and around the word freedom. At some point you say, the word freedom, as Martin Luther King used it, with its call for sympathy and imagination, has receded from public discourse. It has been replaced by its double, a word with connotations that inevitably evoke fear. What is freedom for you? Well, I think in the... Dictionary, you know, in Webster's, it's um, negative, actually. It's a lack of restraint. Uh, it's not being uh, bound, not being tied up or, or rest restrained. And I think that's actually a perfectly good definition. Um, and in a political sense, it has deep meaning. Beyond not being in jail or imprisoned or tied up, uh, I think freedom is a very difficult concept. And in that same essay, I quote Immanuel Kant on when he's writing um, in uh, Practical Reason, not the Critique of Reason. And he talks about how difficult it is for people to essentially think for themselves, to think freely. And uh, I think ideas are contagious. And so it's very hard to free ourselves from certain conventions, ways of thinking. But... Uh, I suppose for me, anyway, the avenue to what I think of as free thought has to do with occupying multiple perspectives, hmm? not being bound to only my place, whatever that is in the culture, say, white, middle class woman with a lot of education but moving from my position into other places and then imagining what it would be like to be someone else. And that creates a remarkable kind of freedom, I think, because you're not bound to your place in the world. Of course, this is what the novel is. You know, you become others. 
For most of my life, I have felt that reading and writing are precisely the two places in life where I am liberated from the constraints of my sex, where the dance of being the other takes place unhindered, and the free play of identifications allows entrance into a multitude of human experiences. When I am working, I feel this extraordinary freedom, my plurality. But I have discovered that out there in the world, woman writer is still a brand on a writer's forehead, not easily erased, that being George remains preferable to being Marianne. It's very interesting that you say occupying another's position to enjoy uh, writing as a man, for instance, and you feel that you access things that you don't as a woman. Do you think economic and political development have changed women's status, women's roles, expectations? Absolutely. I mean, I don't know when women in Portugal uh, got the vote, but in the United States it was 1920. Um, in Norway, it was 1913. And when you think that in the United States, women have not even had the vote for 100 years, that's just one very long lifetime, uh, then I think one would have to say that there's been tremendous progress for women. On the other hand, uh, I think it's not over yet. You know, women in the United States, still very just facts, they make 77 cents uh, for every dollar a man makes. That's not equality, and it's for the same work. So a lot of this, I think, is, is due to um, unconscious perceptions of women and very deep... Uh, metaphors in the culture, so that women are perceived as soft and men as hard. This is old, and these metaphors are shaping. No one thinks that soft thinking is good. You know, soft is, is, is not a good thing. And so these prejudices are often implicit, not explicit. And they go on. You know, we make, we create our perceptions. We are creative, active perceivers of the world. We're not passive recipients of it. A physicist friend of mine told me that women in his field generally disguise their bodies in manly attire to fit in with the powers that be. But he had also noticed a trend when a woman has reached a position of respect and acclaim, when she has secured her reputation as brilliant, her sartorial discipline begins to unravel. Colors formerly unseen, high heels, makeup, and jewelry appear in rapid succession on her body, as if these accoutrements of womanliness were the tokens of a long, restrained sexual energy as if the poor thing has suddenly been allowed to burst into bloom. For all its strides in the right direction, the Enlightenment elevated reason to an impossible stature. And because women were lumped with its opposite, with the irrational forces in human life, no longer inexplicable or mystical, just situated on the wrong side of the fence, Women languished there until they could claim reason and the rights of man as their own. Do you think men are happy masters still in our society? Um, I think there are a lot of unhappy servants, too. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, you know, there was just, I just read recently in the New York Times, uh, two 
academics did a uh, large survey of university professors. I think there were 6,500 university professors around uh, the United States, and it was uh, an ex experiment. Uh, they sent the same letter to all of these professors, men and women, you know, from uh, prominent universities across the country. It was a letter from a phantom student asking about a PhD program. The only difference was that there were different names attached, male or female, and also ethnic names. So names that sounded Hispanic, that sounded black, that sounded Asian. Uh, and they discovered that all these highly educated people preferred, but significantly preferred, the name that sounded white and male. So that was men and women, you know? Women are also sexist. Women are also dupes of implic implicit uh, sexism and racism. It's very disheartening, of course, uh, because I think the only way to change this is to make it conscious. And the only way to make it conscious is to have a constant cultural conversation about how we perceive the other. I learned to lower my voice when I spoke at seminars in graduate school to try to sound dispassionate even when I was quaking with feeling. I called on masculine forms to ensure I was taken seriously to hide the girl. Over time, those forms became me, too. A feminism, in some way, theoretically, uh, lost itself in its own battles. This is theoretical academic feminism in uh, battles between, for example, equality feminism, you know, practical feminism, but also theoretically saying men and women are more the same than they are different. And difference feminism that wanted to emphasize the difference, you know, arguing that men and women really are essentially different and we should embrace those differences and go forward on that basis. Uh, and I think just as in every discipline, uh, the internal fighting became very noisy indeed. But outside of that uh, world, not very many people were paying attention. Uh, and, you know, I am a person who does not believe really in essential identities. I think we are dynamic, uh, changing creatures uh, that we certainly have some kind of mammalian biological self, but that keeps changing over time as well. So identity politics was never very attractive to me. And I, I guess I've always felt that men and women, race is not even a biological category, it's a kind of invention of history, uh, that these notions don't interest me very much. You know, humanity interests me, and now there's even talk, of course, about speciesism, uh, that uh, animals have to be included in the way we think about our world, and of course, uh, the, the environment in general. So, uh, we have to create I think, dy dynamic theoretical models for embracing all of this. We have a great deal in common with rats, you know, more than we would like to believe. And, uh, and I think we have 
we do have an essential sense of this mammalian self that moves around in the world and explores it. And, uh, and then we have something extra. We have uh, reflective self-consciousness. We're able to imagine ourselves as others. And that's very important. I mean, that is a distinguishing feature. But you know, there are birds and uh, other animals who recognize themselves in the mirror. So they have some form of reflective consciousness, I think. And that's why the barriers are dropping pretty quickly. Uh, you know, animals uh, have far richer uh, social and inner lives than, uh, than the Christian chain of being would have us believe. You're very interested in, in psychoanalysis and neuroscience. Do you, do you think psychoanalysis, and maybe even going back to Freud, is it a way of freeing ourselves or recognizing the things, very deep things, that really bind us in the end? Well, you know, Freud was a pessimist. He was, I think he once described himself something uh, in some way where he essentially said he was an optimistic pessimist. Um, I would say I occupy that position too. Human beings are not infinitely malleable. You know, we have uh, aspects of ourselves. You know, we can't, we can't, we'll never fly. Uh, we're tied to the ground in, in very important ways. At the same time, uh, psychoanalysis, and I, I really believe this, uh, is a vehicle for freedom. And the reason it is a vehicle for freedom is because one can identify unconscious patterns of behavior, ways of behaving that we're not aware of. And by making them conscious, it becomes possible to change them. So a lot, a lot, uh, you, a lot of, um that is important is this theme of bringing to light bringing things, to light, yes. th things that are unconscious. Yes, yes. Most of, I mean, one thing that neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience and Freud have in common is that it is now an absolute certainty that mo most of what the brain mind does is unconscious. You know, not so long ago, uh, during the heyday of behaviorism, uh, scientists insisted that the unconscious didn't matter or possibly didn't even exist. That is no longer the case. Writing fiction is also, I think, an intersubjective act. Nobody writes for oneself alone. It's always for an other, but you're writing for an imaginary other. Uh, and I, I've asked myself, who is that? And it was after I read something that Nabokov said about his reader. And he said that he realized that his, reader, his readers were all these little Nabokovs <laughs> <laughs> who understood everything. It's a very narcissistic statement. But at the same time, I understood that it held part of the truth which is that in some way the ideal reader is the person who's read everything you've read, who gets all your jokes, your puns, you know, everything. And so there is a mirroring aspect of this too. But um, no, there is a difference. Nevertheless, like psychoanalysis, literature deals with unconscious material. You don't know where this stuff comes from. It appears on the page, and it can often surprise you. You mentioned the um, movements of emancipation, uh, racial, also gender-based. Do you think there is a line of progress, a continuous progress, or are we just going up and down circles, maybe? Oh, yes. Well. I think that the 19th century idea of progress that we have inherited and is often assumed, it's a, an implicit understanding in our culture that at least in certain ways, 
the world is getting better and better or smarter and smarter. I do not think this is true. I do not believe in that kind of positivism. Uh, I don't, you know, there's, it's very funny because the idea of progress is also accompanied by uh, the idea of doom and cataclysm at the same time. So the world is, is ending and we're getting smarter and better at the same time. So there's a paradox at work in the culture. Part of this, and this is not to diminish, for example, ecological crises that I think are happening now enormously and have to be dealt with, but it's also the hubris of the present. You know, that, uh, that everything is better and worse than at any other time. I mean, Dickens, of course, said this. It was the, the best of times and the worst of times. So, uh, but no, progress uh, is, I think, a false idea. And I've often encountered people who are startled when I tell them that for example, there were moments in psychiatry that are superior to the present. Um, that the 19th century and the early 20th century was actually um, a period of more subtle thinking about uh, psychiatric categories and diagnosis than uh, the current ones in the DSM. Uh, people are shocked and uh, doctors themselves find it hard to accept that. But I really believe that. I think things have gone downhill in psychiatry. <laughs> and, uh, and they should be remedied. And part of the remedy is recovering lost ideas. You mentioned the present. We are all always, and especially now, dumbfounded with materials, pieces, gadgets that are coming forward and that every, are announced like this is going to change our life for, or is, is yeah. already changing. So do you believe these, this material development has an impact on how we... Oh, there's no question that technology affects us. There's absolutely no question about that. The, what I uh, disagree with is the idea that human beings are fundamentally altered for the worse because now we're using computers. If you return to the arrival of the train in, uh, in, you know, during the Industrial Revolution, suddenly the train is a vehicle that's going faster than any other vehicle has ever gone, gone before. The alarm about the train was immense. And the reaction was intense. It's very much the way uh, the, the response to the internet, people writing books now that uh, our brains will turn to mush because we're using a new form of technology. Uh, there was an illness called railway spine that was invented particularly for the train. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the sh railway shock was a disease, an illness, connected to hysteria, actually, for people who had been in railway accidents, and supposedly the shock, because the train was so fast, meant that it was worse than any other shock, worse than falling off a horse, worse than a carriage accident, for example. Now, we know that isn't true. Shock is shock. You know, if you have a near-fatal accident, it doesn't matter whether you're on a train or in a rocket. It's all the same. But that's how it was conceived at the time. And I think a lot of alarm and fear about current technology resembles that. Do you think that art is a way to warn us and also prepare us for good and bad things that lurk somewhere, are coming in the future, development is going to bring? Well, there's no question that art can be prescient. And I think one of the reasons we touched on it earlier is that sometimes, in fact often, the work of art knows more than the artist. And that's because works of art are drawing on more than just consciousness. They're 
coming from places that the artist, him or herself, is not even aware of. And I think this absolutely fascinates me about what art can be. There are certain works that simply outstrip the artist uh, entirely. You think about someone like Dostoevsky, an anti-Semite, huh? And nevertheless, he wrote The Brothers Karamazov, and in that book, the philosophical dialogues, the tension uh, of these various voices is much greater than any essay Dostoevsky could have ever written himself. He was at some place that was quite beyond him. You have this wonderful story of reading with a lot of light in yes, Iceland. That's right. Can you can you tell us about? Yes, I mean it's uh, the memory is very intense, and I've returned to it over and over again. Um, but I was reading many novels. It was a moment in my life. It happened sometime be around twelve. I discovered I could read books with small print that I could penetrate them. I didn't have to struggle anymore. And I read one novel after another. During the summer, my father was studying the sagas in uh, Iceland. We had rented a house in Reykjavik, and, and it never got dark. And I had trouble sleeping for the first time in my life. I'm sure that my uh, inner clock was off. My diurnal rhythms were disturbed. So I stayed up and read. And I loved these books. I became, I was the characters. I was David Copperfield. And the experiences were so rich for me that that summer, I remember putting down David Copperfield, going to the window, it was still light, looking out. And, uh, and Reykjavik was lit by this eerie midnight sun. And in my memory, of course, memory is shifting and changes, but the way I've mythologized the decision, which did happen that summer, is that I looked at the sleeping, uh, lit city of Reykjavik and decided to become a writer, really because of what the books had done to me, uh, altered me. And I thought, if people can be changed by books, then this is what I want to do. It's a very arrogant position for a 13-year-old, you know, but I took it on. Okay, here we go, here we go. More happy smiling. 